Okay, we're going live. Okay. <clears throat> so hello everybody and welcome to the gala webinar series. My name is Isabella Massardo and I'm the content strategist here at Gala. Gala is a nonprofit trade association connecting and supporting the global language industry. Today, we are going to have a webinar on how to make your live events more accessible to a more diverse audience. Before we get to the discussion and before I introduce uh, the presenters, um, I'm going to go quickly over some platform info. Although I know that by now we are all pros at Zoom uh, and webinars in general, still. Um, for now, you are muted, and if you experience any technical difficulties, you can let me know by uh, using your chat box, and I will work with you to troubleshoot. If you have questions for the presenters, please type them uh, using the QA box or the chat box. We will, get, um, we will try to get as many questions as we have time for during the presentation and at the end of the presentation. And of course, feel free to use the chat box to give feedback and comments. Um, if you have a slow internet connection, your audio may be disrupted. If that happens, uh, you can use the number listed in the Zoom invitation to call in using your phone. Uh, we are making a recording of this presentation and you will be able to find it later on the GALA website. So now let me uh, introduce you, uh, the presenters. Uh, we have Maren Higby from Mighty Media, welcome. She's an Emmy-nominated producer and writer. With over two decades in the industry, both network television and corporate communications, Maren became interested in inclusive communication and brand integration. Then we have Laura Webb. Hello, welcome. Uh, she's development associate at Mighty Media. Uh, she has been heavily involved with developing a production strategy for American Sign Language accessibility on global events and executive conferences that shifted to virtual. We also have uh, Simone Perone, Vice President of Product Management I Translated, welcome. He's responsible for the project of the Euro Parliament plenary sessions in real-time transcription and for the two new audiovisual post-editing products, Made Sub and Made Dub. And then we have Michael Stevens, who doesn't need any introduction, but I'm gonna do it anyway who I translated is responsible for growth and finding interesting companies to work with and challenging many assumptions about localization in the process. He's the co-host of the Global Podcast and he explores areas of the localization industry that spark his own curiosity and he then shares it with the industry at large. So guys, the floor is yours. I believe Marin is gonna start first. Marin, over to you. Thank you. Hey, Marin. Marin, I'm gonna I'm gonna interrupt. So, is that okay? It's we're we're presenting among friends here. So, uh, good morning from Seattle. We are grateful that you guys are attending, and uh, we are excited. Uh, we have partnered. Uh, I have partnered personally with Mighty Media in the past. Uh, they are one of the great media production companies based here in Seattle. They're taking care of all the frontline production with some of the largest names in technology in this area. Uh, on the back end, the companies I've worked with have done the localization and translation for them for some of that work. Uh, we've partnered on some of the nonprofit work in the area. And so this is a, a really exciting opportunity to sort of expose this. Uh, since this sort of big shift that we had last year, uh, the way that events are done, the way that media is produced has changed significantly, and Mighty has been on the front end of that. And so I thought this would be a great chance for our industry to hear about those changes, think about how we might be able to benefit from it, and just sort of get up to speed and maybe learn a little bit there. Uh, and really one of the big emphasis we see more and more from our clients is not just around sort of language and content production, but all of this being done in light of accessibility, that that becomes really the key driver is how, how do we get uh, more content, more relevance, more engagement from everyone. So that's really gonna be the theme we keep coming back to in this as we talk about sort of our work in our companies and what we've seen. Um, I 
at Translated, we're going to talk about one of the projects we're working on and then an actual product that has come out of that project. Uh, we have a very clear call to action from that. The product is in beta. And so for anyone on this call, we would ask that you go and check it out yourself. This is our mate sub product. And if it's not relevant to you, find a friend who's, who it's relevant to and send it to them um, because we're gathering feedback here. And I've got Simone Perone on the call and he's gonna be able to answer any of the technical questions or questions around how this was developed, where it came from, what kind of feedback are we looking for in those things. So that's sort of what we're, we're going for today. And please interact within the chat, ask questions. Uh, if we do this correctly, we're going to be taking pauses to be able to answer your questions in the flow of our presentation rather than waiting to the end when we're like, what did I say back then? Oh my goodness, I don't even remember. Um, so we'll try to keep it more natural there. So please feel free. Uh, Isabel, if at any point we talk too much, we haven't had anyone, had anyone ask questions and they're waiting, please feel free to jump in and let us know that there's a question waiting for us in the chat. I now will. with... Excellent. With that introduction, I'm going to turn it over to Marin and uh, let her introduce Mighty and some of the work there. Hi, thank you, Mike. First off, I want to say I have had a peek at this tool and it is mind bogglingly cool. I was really excited. So I can't wait to see another demo of it because we just did kind of a quick click through. But anyways, um, as, Isabella said, as Isabella introduced me, I'm Marin Higby. I am the director of development and executive producer at Mighty Media Studios. Um, we're a full production, um, we're a full video production house, but because of the pandemic, we've been really scooped into some interesting things. We already were doing live production, um, live streaming, webinars, but we'd never done anything of this scale. So I'll talk a little bit about sort of virtual events weren't new. Um, as all this came about, you know, you and I, we've probably been to a few virtual events, mostly webinars. But what was really interesting about when the pandemic hit was it really, really pushed everybody to get online. And a lot of people think about, okay, accessibility, we're talking about language, or we're talking about descriptive audio and ASL. But the thing that happened that's really, really interesting to me, in addition to those things, is that it pushed the, the Luddites or the people that weren't um, willing to learn anything beyond communicating with family or whatever, they've had to jump online and get into this world to continue with their activities. And I've seen this really, really prevalent in the um, nonprofit sector. And what the value of that is, is a lot of these are some of the largest donors that weren't partaking in any of the digital events, but only going to live events. So all of a sudden you have them learning how to use the computer, learning how to get involved and being able to make the donations even though the pandemic was happening. So, um, but with this huge change in scope of how live events go, there were some major, major challenges. So I wanna talk about some of the things that happened on the, um, the difficult side. So the first thing that happened was it's new technology, new challenges. So you've got, um, you've got all these people trying to get into this environment, which is on one side, and then you've got the whole industry on the other side. So something that was going on before, when you would do a big show like this, everybody would be gathered together in this tight little room. You've probably seen it in a newsroom setting on TV at some point where there's all the screens and the director is calling the shots. So when you're watching the news or a show, um, you're not just watching one talking head or of whoever's talking. You're watching a line cut of, uh, you know, person that's talking, the reaction, two people talking so that there's some visual interest. Well, we did that all in a little room. Now, because everything's virtual, we were streaming it out, sure, but we couldn't all be in that little room anymore. So there was this whole setup on the back end that had to happen on the production side. And this means that we had to patch all kinds of things together. And I'm proud to say that John Moffat, the founder of our company, was the first one to figure out how to, um, it's called live switching, to live switch a production so that 
people on the other side of watching a conference, one of these large, large conferences like BUILD, like CES, um, could see a line cut instead of being stuck in what we see when we're in a, in a, um, in a webinar, which nothing's wrong with a webinar, but when you go to BUILD or CES, you're not expecting to be in a webinar, you're expecting an experience. And that's something else that we lost, um, that people don't get together. And we had to figure out how to make those rooms work so that there's some networking happening. So that was also an interesting challenge that I think is going in the right direction, but that's one area I would say we still need quite a bit of work on. The next thing that is really, really impactful is we're reliant on uncontrolled networks. So normally when we're streaming live something, we have people in the same building, we have them in areas that we have a very, very large control of what the network is. So I know in translation services, you guys are familiar with redundancies. It's very, very um, important for us as well that if, if your uh, Wi-Fi connection goes down, we're gonna toss you to cellular or satellite so that the viewer on the other side has no idea that a network went down. But when we have everybody coming from multiple places all over the globe, we have no um, we have no control over that. So, for example, there was a conference that happened recently at one of the big technology um, houses where or one of the big technology conferences, and we were doing some pre-records, trying to make sure we get all the languages and the ASL and the descriptive audio and everything ready for the day the show went live. And then we take those pre-records and drop them into places in the show so that we know we have it all dialed in perfectly. Well, there was a couple of um, translators where their connection was dropping out and there wasn't redundancy. So I think, I know Laura knows a lot more about this, but um, as far as I understand, they had four of these shoots to happen in one day but because of the dropout in this translation and because of these interruptions in the connection, the, um, the pre-recording had to stop and restart over and over again. So I came to, I came to set somewhere around two o'clock and they should have been at least halfway through four productions and they were still recording one. And I kept hearing as I was standing in the room, Japan's dropped out, Japan's dropped out again. And then, you know, uh, Chinese is unusable. And it was just like, oh no. So it's, it's something that we are very reliant on. Now in our professional services, we can take care of this, but when you're calling in and having somebody famous or um, just very distinguished in their industry, you don't know where they're gonna be. So, um, you can't really control what's happening. So the only thing that we can think to do is if it's a live stream and we can at least keep audio live, we'll put a photograph of them up. But when so many people are streaming in, it causes a lot of challenges. So um, as far as savings, I've read a lot of articles where people say, oh, this has saved so much money. And there is savings on one side. I'll talk about that in a minute. But Overall, you think, oh, we're not paying for food and the social events and the, the travel to the location and the booth setup and the um, everything, everything else that goes in the event space. But what happens is the technology that you need on the other side and the crew that you need to run this technology is increased substantially. So you've got a lot of new opportunities, but a lot of times we find it comparable or just mildly less expensive if you're the host of the event. As an attendee, yes, it's incredibly less expensive, but as, as a host. So one of those examples is when we are dialing somebody in the way we are today for a conference or for a recording, we have a producer assigned to every single person that is on camera, every single person. So what that means is you've got, instead of what you'd normally have two or three producer, if you have 15 guests and they're alternating in and five at a time because you need to have a half hour ahead of time so they can dial in, you look at their camera, you check their audio, you make sure that, you know, if they're talking to you like this, you get them to shift like this so it doesn't look so weird. 
unless you like it like that, that's kind of interesting. Anyways, <laughs> um, so there's a lot of costs associated with that. Um, before I go into the opportunities, I'm curious if anyone has any questions about the challenges that we faced or anything that I talked about. Yeah, and Martin, I think some of the part of the articles written about cost savings, a lot of them are written about like cost to attend as well for, for attendees. Um, I love that you're giving the perspective of when you're hosting these, actually, because of the production value, the costs are increasing. The, the human humans needed to manage this greater production value and the variables around technology, that's an increase in costs. So um, a, a number of these companies probably are at least spending equal, if not more, out of the gate to be able to get this done. Yeah, it, it, it varies. Uh, we do have one client that's saving. And then if you go for a traditional webinar instead of your conference, you can save a lot of money, but the experience is is not comparable to a live event. Um, I don't know that what we do is comparable to a live event, but um, build, um, we did CES this year and I heard that was a huge success. It wasn't like walking the, the showroom floor, but um, and CES is the Consumer Electronics Show, which happens in Vegas, and it's one of the biggest conferences of the year. So if you aren't familiar with that one, it's just, it's one of those big things that people have this whole, you know, they're revealing all the new technology for the year, and it's just really exciting. Um, and, and many of these companies already had live streams, but they were kind of bolt on. Right. They were just like, ah, the real thing is here. So buy your ticket and come. But if for some reason this year you can't, we're going to have a live stream. And it wasn't built for accessibility, which these new events now are being built for accessibility. Right. If you if you watch the stream, it wasn't very accessible. If you were there live, sure. But they often they don't put the ASL interpreter on camera with the keynote speaker. But now as you'll learn in a little bit, with Alora's help, you get the ASL, which that's it's also fascinating. All right, I'm going to move into some of the opportunities because this is the stuff I'm really excited about. So we've talked about the expanded reach. Um, there are so many ways that the reach has expanded. There are the ones that are really easy to figure out. Like, yes, you can, people that couldn't fly out or couldn't afford to fly out are now able to attend the events. A lot of hosts are finding different ways to make money instead of having um, people pay their way in, they're giving them free. This is another reason why hosting the event is, is not as, um, it's not cheaper to do it this way because you're not getting those, those fees anymore. But the other thing that I've seen that I'm like beyond excited about, and I, I, I think I need to find a new word for excited, but um, is is that we're able to reach different areas of globe, the globe and we're able to hear stories from, from people and experts that normally wouldn't attend. We can get them to find a place with a somewhat good uh, internet connection, but they wouldn't have flown out because they were stuck in their research. For example, for companies like um, Fred Hutch, they have, or the Infectious Disease Research Institute, they have, um, changed their name and gone under a whole bunch of changes. But something that I know those two, and I'm sure that Gates and um, Allen Institute and all those big companies are doing is you've got a research specialist somewhere in the middle of South Africa and they're in a small village and they're trying to figure out how to do something. You can get them to a central location and they can get on with their colleagues or they can get on a conference and start sharing their research much earlier in a, in a live stream setting where you can do a Q&A with them instead of just simply the articles and the blog posts that they could do before. So the things that you can do in this platform are incredible. Like, so think about, you, you may not be able to get, um, you know, Madonna to your conference, but you might be able to get her to dial in for an hour. It's still going to cost you a lot of money, but the chances of getting things is a lot easier. And a lot of the, the speakers and celebrities that we know of are excited about this chance to not be leaving their families all the time and still being able to contribute to society in the way that they feel good about. Um, 
The next thing is the recording has been made very, very easy. So like we're recording this today, you'll be able to access this later. That's something that's been normal for web conferences or web uh, webinars for a very long time. But when you're at an event, there is a, um, you have to choose where you're gonna film. So most of the time when we go to conferences, what companies like Microsoft will do, they'll, they'll call us in and um, we bring a truck, which is like a, 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 a big old truck with a control room in it that's got all the technology we need and the amount of wires coming out from underneath this thing is insane. So there's all these people squished in this little box and they're doing what I was explaining where they're directing the cut so that you see this beautiful presentation, but they're not gonna do this for all the breakout rooms. Well, maybe you're more interested in the breakout rooms, but they're only gonna be making this high quality thing for the keynote speeches usually. So I know it, with Microsoft, it's, it's generally the keynote speeches. But now that we have, you've got all these breakout rooms because they're already streaming in this scenario, you can just have them all recorded and you already know the audio's done. You already know that somebody's checked the visuals so all of a sudden your entire conference is going to be easily available in a recorded format instead of a really beautiful keynote and then a set it and forget it camera in the back of a breakout room, which is what they usually do. They usually drop a camera and maybe a camera person in the back of a room. Sometimes they make sure it's wired up properly for audio. Sometimes they don't. Um, this is not something that Mighty does. This is what the... Um, why am I forgetting it, Alora? Alora has to be my second brain all the time. The companies that do the, the not VR, the a, AV, the AV companies, the audio. Oh yeah, sorry. I was taking a moment myself. Yeah, <laughs> uh, Alora and I work closely. So um, I she has to share part of her brain with me most of the time. That's just the way it is. Cause she's like that. Mike, I see you came off mute. I was coming up with AV for you. You. We got it. Everybody's on board. All right. Um, and the last thing I'll talk about before I turn it over to Alora is that the technology supports a much more diverse uh, audience in both language and ability. So I used to do a talk show for Microsoft every month, and I did it for three and a half years. It was called Modern Workplace. And the first two to three years, we only um, did we did machine translated, uh, very poorly machine translated. We were not working with translated at the time uh, in six languages and we only cleaned up English. Um, and then when we would do conferences, we would do closed captioning and every, every video that we supplied had to have burn in English. So everything just sort of assumed that, well, you're going to speak some English, so at least you can look at the, the translation for English and at least you can read it if they're speaking too quickly. Well, that's no longer the case. One, machine translations got better. I was doing this in 2014 to 2017, so everything's just gotten better and better and better. Like even just thinking about what Mike's showing is something that would have been um, dreamy to have back then. Um, but we're also making sure that we, we talk to people um, that need extra help. So we are doing descriptive audio now. And sometimes you think like, okay, on a talk show, how much descriptive audio do you need? Um, my sister is blind, so I'm more familiar with it's, there's so many subtle cues that you get out of descriptive audio that you don't even really notice. So if you're watching a talk show and they, they have an exchange and somebody gets up and runs around and hoots, the blind person only hears the hoot, but they don't know that, you know, Oprah showed a picture to somebody and they loved it and they jumped up on the couch and, and hooted. And then all of a sudden there's all these jokes about jumping up on the couch like Tom Cruise and the, the blind person is like trying to catch up. Well, now it is an absolute mandate from from Microsoft and from Amazon that anything that we do that streams out has to be accessible to everybody. Now, the reason I say accessible for most, there are some things that are still one under the, uh, you know, we're still working on figuring out what different communities need, 
But two, one of the problems that is not solved yet, and um, lots of companies are working on it, but I nobody's gotten there quite yet, is making sure that there is actually internet access in every country. You cannot, you cannot live stream into a lot of sub-Saharan Africa. We do a lot of work with Fred Hutch, and when we are creating um, sort of trainings for different research uh, research projects that are happening there, we have to we have to send thumb drives. We cannot stream anything in, and streaming would be much better. So we could do a Q and A, but we have to do the thumb drive and then do emails back and forth. So that's the last area that I see as something that needs to change. So next, we're going to go to Laura to learn more about what incorporating American Sign Language takes. Um, I'm curious if we have any questions. Not for now, but they'll, they'll come. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not worried about it, but now okay. I'm going to toss it over. I'm going to toss it over to Laura so you can <laughs> everything that she's come up with with sign language it's incredible so laura take it away oh my what an intro <laughs> um well yeah so i'm laura and um i've had the privilege this past year to collaborate with um a crew of asl interpreters and some of i think the best production minds in the business um to streamline asl accessibility and support on virtual events uh, specifically for microsoft production studios um, so I thought I'd just share more about kind of the journey, um, because I feel like the framework that we've worked on is really applicable for all types of accessibility. Um, and the first was the tech, um, which was handled by the engineering minds at Microsoft, um, in collaboration with their expert guidance from Microsoft's interpreting staff. Um, and we knew we needed at least four interpreters supporting continuous programming on every single hour that the programming was live. Um, and so we achieved this by leveraging Microsoft Teams. Um, we created a two-way channel running the interpreter feed, so the picture you would see of me here, um, through a fly pack to broadcast. And then we were sending the program back to them through the same call. And we would rot we rotate through interpreters every 15 to 20 minutes at content breaks or changes. Um, so that's kind of like a brief overview of the technical side of kind of how we get this to broadcast um, successfully. Um, but the next step uh, was preparing a team of interpreters to support, you know, sometimes 24, 72 plus hours of continuous programming so that the audience had the best possible experience. Um, that's no small feat. So um, we partnered with the experts. That's what you do when you have a question. And um, there was a lot of collaboration with Microsoft's accessibility team um, and also with our vendor um, to hire the interpreters for this event. And we also utilized and listened and learned from them, um, you know, the interpreters that we hired when kind of establishing an initial workflow. And, and we continue to refine that process each show. Um, it was a little bumpy at first. There were, there were things that needed to be ironed out. Um, you know, one example that comes to mind is on, I think the first one or two shows, um, the interpreters could not see um, themselves live on the return feed broadcast. They couldn't see that composite box that they were being um, placed into. And so they were relying on production's voice in their ear to tell them when they were live and when they weren't, which was distracting while they were actively interpreting, you know, the program that feed that was coming in. Um, so we had to kind of reconfigure that so that there was a visual element as well that could support them. Um, just as an example of kind of some of the early issues that we had to work out. Um, but for me, the most like important invaluable lesson that was realized early on was the need to include the interpreting process into the production like workflow from start to finish. Because every time something changes on the content side, it impacts the workflow for the interpreters that are preparing that content. Um, it's not a job where you can just be expected to show up with very little context and go. 
Um, they're an extension of the content that countless hours and countless dollars often went into producing. Um, and so looping them into the scripted materials or pre-recorded content, the speaker bios, key terminology, you know, specified signs even is, is really appreciated. Um, and then also technical rehearsals themselves. It all sounds like a no brainer when you list it out like that, but after a year of collaborating with them, um, I was truly shocked to learn just how often they come to jobs and they're not properly prepared to do those jobs. And it's stressful on them too, because they take a lot of pride in their work and they want to make it a good experience for the audience. Um, so, so much nuance can be missed when an interpreter is expected to work with minimal preparedness and it just creates a subpar experience for the people viewing it. Um, so my biggest advice would be like in terms of your audience experience, uh, it's just my my motto is always like set them up for success, set the interpreters up for success. Um, you know, it should be the number one priority because, um, you know, establish your secure file shares, get your confidentiality agreements, do whatever you need to do, remind the executive teams that might be nervous about handing over classified info before it goes to air that, you know, their preparedness is is to that content's benefit. They're an extension of it. Um, Alora, just to yeah. highlight what you've said, I've heard that feedback on this shift from interpreters mm -hmm. over and over again, that like the, the ability to prepare for these live events because travel is eliminated actually right. has gone way up and companies are, are doing a lot better in preparation. And also with those last minute changes that they're, yes. they're, they're ready to get the last minute changes much more easily. Whereas before they would be, um, uh, sort of on call, but only checking in at certain periods of time now, because it's all virtual, it, it can come within their email or a chat mm -hmm. that they they respond pretty easily. Yeah, and I think that the next step is, is, you know, how is getting that stuff into their hands even sooner. I think, you know, so much of especially live production happens um, very rapidly. Um, and, and there's a lot of changes at the last minute. And so, um, you know, sometimes that especially for rundown shifts, if you have, you know, interpreters scheduled from, you know, eight to 2pm, um, and then, you know, a segment block is moved to the four o'clock and now you've got to train a whole new set of interpreters on the content that someone else was working on. Um, just kind of ironing out some of that. And that's kind of why I referenced, um, you know, bringing in the interpreting process into the production workflow is that, you know, remembering that those changes impact an entire segment of your audience if there's not enough lead time for, for them to prepare. Um, so that's kind of why I was hitting that home a little bit harder. We're, we're getting some nodded heads in the chat. And, Great. I'm uh, so Ale happy to hear Ale it. Yeah. Alexander <laughs> is confirming what we're talking about here. So that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so uh, if you want to go to the next slide, Marm, I just kind of wanted to share some, some um, of the uh, feedback from, oh, sorry, the next one. Yeah, there it is. Um, just from the audience that I see on these events on Twitter and everything, um, you know, Microsoft's partners and customers really appreciate the initiative um, and they love to share their excitement, as you can see here. But I just think, you know, and I think everyone in this audience would agree that it's just more importantly, um, the production inclusion of services like ASL, like foreign language, like descriptive audio and captioning, it just means that everyone's involved in the conversation. And so I think we just have to keep continuing to listen and learn and, and just refine the process so that everyone is getting a seat at the table is really what it's about. Um, that's kind of uh, a little bit about what I've been working on the last year. And if there's any questions, I'd be happy to dive into something more specifically. You know, Laura is just coming off a, <laughs> what, six days of working on ASL for MS Ignite? Yeah, it was, um, if, yeah, if anything, I'm a little bit, um, it's, an, it's been a long week, but I'm, I'm happy to be here. So I apologize if anything was a little rambly, but. <laughs> it was it was fabulous. It was fabulous. Yeah. So. Well, thank you. Yeah, um, I'm happy to answer questions. Oh. You are getting some feedback that uh, there's a lot of love about more online events offering sign language and other app, uh, options like live captions. Mm -hmm. So this is this is definitely hitting with the audience. It's great. Yeah, and I think you know one thing I maybe didn't touch on and uh, when I was speaking about tech is just kind of also there's an element of configuring their setups as well um, because they're used to going to these events in person. And so there's a lot of time. Um, you know, I kind of have a core group of interpreters that 
continue to work with us on these events. So their setups have been refined and, and um, established over the last year, but every event we get new people. And so it's a process of meeting with them. And, you know, it's kind of fun, you know, it's, to be a, a, a fly on the wall for those phone calls, because um, oftentimes, I mean, these aren't like professional studios, these are people's home offices. And so we'll have them like tilting lamps in strange directions and bouncing things off of walls and like <laughs> steaming backdrops and um, doing all kinds of stuff to make it the most uh, uh, professional setup that we can. And um, uh, and that was an aspect of it too, is, you know, like what cameras are they using? What's their, what's their internet connection and, and collaborating with them on that to make it um, a better experience for them also. So they're not stressing about, is my tech gonna fail? Um, that's, that's, I think an element that can sometimes be lost is the preparedness extends also just past the, the content you can give them ahead of time, but, you know, making sure that they feel secure in their setup before they start. Laura, uh, Mike, I know that you went off mute, but there's one thing I think Alora can share that might be helpful to some of, of, of our audience here today. And that's what things did ASL interpreters do that make your job easier? What ways can you collaborate that are easier and what things that might not might be surprising caused you some heartache and 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 complication. Oh my! Uh, things they did to make my job easier. Um, anytime they told me exactly what they needed, because then I could just be like, "Great," and go and get that. <laughs> um, there was no guesswork in it. I was like, "What do you need? Great. You know, we'll go and do that." And then the second half, your question. Sorry. The second half was: if, if there anything that maybe you know somebody did that that caused you a lot of problem, but it, they like any of your ASL. I know some of them are more difficult than others, and that's just collaborating between people. Sometimes you know different relationships are better. Um, I don't know if anyone caused me any sort of like difficulty. I think that there was a learning curve in um, in kind of like how dense sometimes, especially like technical language can be, and and how um, you know it's not only um, a mentally taxing. Um, workflow, but it's also physically taxing at a point. And so um, I think uh, one of the challenges was making sure that everyone was work, being able to work at 100% um, and not getting overexerted. And so we had to develop um, a process where we were able to switch live every 15 minutes so that there was enough break time built in throughout the day so that when they were on screen, you know, they were feeling fresh faced and ready to go. Um, and I don't know, I, I don't even know if I would call that a challenge. It just was, it was something that, you know, we kind of had to, to collaborate on to make it go smoothly in terms of like, how do you switch live without, especially when, you know, with ASL, there's, there's a few seconds delay before um, they've wrapped up a thought or a piece of content. And then, you know, you got to switch, but then something else has already started. And so, you know, how do you do that smoothly so that the viewer isn't missing anything? That was, that was uh, we, um, we've got one more up. question for you, Alora, here yeah. directly, and that is when you were sharing the uh, pre-conference information and how did you do that? Did you distribute it through cloud storage, some shared mm. docs? Yeah, for, um, well, I do a couple of different things. So for information that is, uh, it's a great question because at the start we were doing it all over email and oh my gosh, was that a train wreck? Cause then, you know, if someone's getting a million emails from me and they're having to dig through them and, you know, they don't know if the one that they've got is the most recent, they're having to check timestamps. Um, and so the first thing we did was we created a file share through SharePoint um, just with a password lock. Um, and that was for everything that was not necessarily like high confidential. It was schedules, speaker bios, um, you know, things that were semi known to the public, but were all in one place for them to access. And we would update the documents in live time. So they always knew when they logged in and were there that that was the most up to date information. Mm -hmm. um, but when it came to sending pre recorded content, um, videos, transcripts, uh, things like that, it, it needed to be done through secure file share um, and encrypted emails so that things couldn't be downloaded. And that was just the, the data protocols for Microsoft. I think every company is different. Um, and uh, to be completely frank, that's a process I want to refine for the next show is, you know, how can we get those secure links and those secure documents um, to them in a way that isn't in an email thread that's encrypted? You know, what's, what, where can we do that where it's very similar to kind of like our SharePoint style where um, it's, it's just a one click and everything you need is there. Uh, so that's something we're working on. 
Excellent. We've got one more question. It's a little, it's a broad one. So I think we'll try to come back at the end to it. And it's about making the team live event more engaging for attendees. Mm -hmm. And so I think what, what we're going to walk through real quickly from the translated point of view is this, this idea of the accessibility and people being able to engage there. And then we can sort of talk about optimizing with what time we have left from there, if that sounds good. Um, to our panelists. Does that sound good? So, so for us, I think this is a, a very good segue between um, helping people do their best work, helping the interpreters do their best work at these events. Um, the value at Translated is we believe in people. And so our goal is that people would be understood and be able to understand. So hopefully we'll be able to put ourselves out of business by creating products and tools that lead to that goal in the world. So when we look at things, that's when we look at live events, when we look at uh, the translation process, we're always thinking about how can we equip linguists to do their best work. And uh, over the years, we've developed a number of products around that. I'm gonna highlight one that is uh, been announced and, and currently a working product. And then we're gonna talk about one that you guys can access, like I said, is a, a user case. So for us, um, we believe part of understanding and being understood is for people to have access to the debate in the government. So Translated has been chosen to provide the European Parliament automatic trans transcription and translation in real-time debates. And it will ultimately cover the 24 official languages by the institution. So you can imagine that this would be very important. Um, it is gonna be the first human in the loop speech translation system. And it's, going, it's delivered through a fully localized web and mobile application. There will also be live streaming APIs. So developers can build on top of this other products that will be helpful for the users. Uh, this leverage and context and human in the loop process will provide feedback and adapt in less than one second. So a very ambitious and a huge goal to, within this product. The core difference in this product is the way that the automatic speech recognition relates to MT. Previously, these were sort of hard systems to connect and they were kind of clunky. Um, this new system has a greater tolerance for the data that's coming through the speech recognition, therefore allowing it to be more uh, seamless as it transitions to MT in the text version. Uh, now, Simone understands more of the technical piece of this. Uh, for me, the non-technical person, it reminds me of when I was learning about uh, Xbox, when they were going to the live motion video games. And they were describing how they would need to write code that could take into account users who were playing the game that had different heights, different arm lengths, and yet they were all supposed to do a motion like, for instance, you're hitting a tennis racket. And the, the system had to be able to understand every time the person does that, even though there are all these variables, it's still them swinging a tennis racket. Uh, in essence, that's what this system is being able to provide from the speech to machine text. From there, in the research and the success that we've had, uh, it led us to one of our other goals. And that is that we believe that video should be available to people in all languages. So within the industry, we see that subtitling and dubbing, um, the need is growing much faster than anyone can keep up with. Uh, and there's so many manual procedures that still take place. So from the linguist, there's a ton of manual work. From the project management side of companies, uh, you have uh, first often a project being sent to a transcriber, a minimum day turnaround. There's automatic transcription, but I'm familiar with clients who still are uncomfortable with the output that's coming from there. And so they have a human who they have to send that to, and it's a project back and forth, minimum of one day there. Then a translation project has to be created. 
that sent out to the linguist to do the work. Minimum of two days within that cycle. Once that translation project is received, it has to be incorporated into the video. This is not audio, this is just subtitling. Once it's incorporated to the video, you want to have the linguist go back and do a native language quality check on the video. Again, a very manual process for these people who have to both check to make sure the language is correct and also that the QA uh, guidelines are met for the video itself in a tool that usually at best is not ideal for that type of work. So in comes MateSub. So we believe that MateSub will allow people to do their best creative work, allow linguists to do it. It's an AI tool that automates subtitling, reducing the time and cost so producers can uh, increase the multilingual visual content that's out there. So we allow multi-platform and file support. So whatever video type you have, you can access the product and, and start a project there. Um, and then you can output uh, VTT and SRT files. The key to this being faster and easier to work with for linguists is the checks for the quality assurance are already incorporated into the product itself. So rather than having to guess or following uh, guidelines that are outside of the product, when you go in to do the subtitling, you're able to have a checker similar to a grammar check or a spell check that makes sure you're following the guidelines, for instance, the Netflix guidelines for that particular video. It, it makes it very easy to identify where you're not meeting the guidelines, easily correct and move on to get this done. So transcription, there's a use case for source to source to create clean SRT files can be done more efficiently. Professional translation can also be done more efficiently. Our ultimate goal is to be able to take this uh, day's turnaround that are usually associated with projects like this and bring it down into hours. So hopefully that makes sense. And we're gonna take a quick look at it. Ideally, what we would like people on this call to do is log on to this uh, domain, the beta.matesub.com and check out the product for yourself. Go in, create a project. Um, as you notice things about the product you like, let us know as you notice things you don't like, features you need, let us know there as well. And I'll do a very brief view of this so you, you can understand. We don't want to say too much because we want to have you look at it for the first time. So for translated, you'll notice this is where you can kick off a project. Uh, if you go on the translate, translated.com, we have an instant quote feature for translation projects. This is our core product. We started in 1990, and this is what our business, really the backbone of our business has been built on. And it's a self-service portal to get translations done. Self-service product. You can choose your languages, you can upload a file that you wanna have analyzed, um, and then you click show prices and you get multiple service levels to choose from. So when we go to MateSub, you'll see some very uh, close similarities. One difference is you enter a project name. You can choose start from scratch. This means you don't have an SRT file. And if you want to automatically generate the captions and subtitles with MT, you click this box. Currently that's offered in 10 languages. If your preference is to use the product for more than those 10 languages, you just unclick that and there are more uh, languages available to work in. So for instance, you can choose, as I said, English to English, if you wanna create a clean SRT, or you can do source to target in English to Italian. You can automatically generate subtitles. Um, and then the guidelines part, right now we have two different guidelines that are offered, both the Netflix and the Sky Media guidelines automatically incorporated in the product when you do it. Once you get to this point, you just drag and drop your media file right here and hit start. So for the sake of demoing and time for us, I'm gonna just go into the product and let you guys sort of orient yourselves um, there. 
as you can look at it, it looks like a fairly standard uh, media project. So this is the English to English. You can see it as the name of the project, the time frame. This is the English to English project. We have some of the guidelines listed here as a reference. We have shortcut keys there. But as we start to play the video, you'll see that MateSub has automatically transcribed in this top bar and then provided so subtitles. If you in the live lower on bar. planet Earth and you're one of seven billion people that eats food every day, I need you to pay attention because over the next three decades. And so as these are created, if you go down and you look at the warnings, you can see that this doesn't meet the guidelines that were selected. And at that point, as a linguist, you can go in and make the change to update that. Once you've completed the project, you just go to export and you get a usable file to incorporate back into the video. So the beta is live now. And so, uh, yeah, please go in. Simone, are there any parameters that you would like to share with folks who might be interested in uh, testing the beta at this point? Thank you, Michael. No, for it's important for us to get any kind of feedback. So please, uh, once you use the tool that is already available on the betamatesup.com, just write an email to us to info at matesup.com or contact me or Michael uh, directly. And um, Michael, if you want, I can reply to a question about Alexander. What do we mean for human in the loop? Uh, so in the case of Matesub, what we mean is that this is a, a, a tool for basically for AI assisted subtitle uh, generation. So the typical workflow that you would have in this tool is that up, you upload your video, the machine generates a subtitle and then you will just need to check it and eventually edit it. And the editing means change the text, change the positioning and so on we collect those information from the human user and send it back to the machine so that next time the machine will generate better subtitling. So that's basically the idea of human in the loop. About the respeaking, uh, we are doing something with another product, something like that. We are creating, a, a, let's call it synthetic voices, but actually is a voice cloning. So we are creating an expressive text-to-speech product that will be called MateDub that basically will uh, be able to read a text in an expressive way or use uh, a video as an input, understand how to say the style of the original speaker and transfer the style in another language. So we are still working on that. It's not available. Uh, but we think that in uh, two or three months, we will have a, a first release of the MateDub product. You're muted, Michael. Gosh. So uh, we'll be very interested in getting your feedback uh, as well when that product. So help us out with this one, and then uh, we'll have some other products that are in the pipeline for review there. Now, I know we're coming up on the hour. And so wanted to make sure there's space for any other questions. <laughs> well, Isabel, maybe we could take one moment and sure. um, give a, a, maybe if uh, Marin or Laura have suggestions on engaging attendees that you've seen at these events, like mm -hmm. how that has worked out. Yes. Sure. Um, I, I, I really love that question. There's different formats depending on what you're trying to do. So if you're looking for just straight up information and people are just there to absorb information, it's very, it's very easy to do a much more simple kind of webinar. But when you're looking to really engage people, I think it's, it's, you have to take a step back and think of your project as a show. Don't just take what you would have done in a conference and make it into a video like just set cameras there and record it like that's 
it's, it's different when you're live because you've got the buzz of the room and you can interact. But when that's just on the on the screen, it's it's not as engaging. Like Ted is one of the very rare exceptions where you just watch somebody stand there, but you're selecting exactly what topic you want to hear about. Mm -hmm. Or is it a conference, say like at the level of CES, if you're really interested in phones and they're doing launches of other kinds of products and you're like, ah, I'm really into phones. The way that we worked on engaging people was we have a lot of different things happening. So there's tag board, which is um, what that screen of Laura showed where you can see what people are saying about what's happening. We have the hosts interact with that. We have the live cutting so that we're looking at different angles. We don't just sit on a presenter and a slide. There's nothing wrong with a presenter and a slide, but if you're looking for a really engaging conference you want people to be a part of, really think about it as an experience on a screen. Use music, use graphics, use um, anything that you can think of that you'd see in a TV show. Start looking at TV shows and thinking, oh, what what is this? like? It's not just the storyline that's got you. Some shows it's about colors. Think about your colors. Think about your setting. Where are you recording? Um, and and Marn, really I'm, I'm seeing a lot more parity between, you know, events like uh, telethons and that sort of production or here in the U.S. where we have the Thanksgiving Day parades and they were sort of like raising up the level of engagement of watchers through social and different interactions. And now we're seeing it come in for events. And so the, it's gonna be really hard to distinguish between these things at some point. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's, gonna be totally, it's gonna be totally difficult to distinguish. And like an example of, of something that uh, Mike and I have both been a part of is when all this fundraising stuff hit, uh, Mike and I work together with the Museum of History and Industry here in Seattle. And normally what we do for innovation events is have a panel of speakers that are all doing different kinds of innovations. And we have a moderator and everybody comes and they have drinks and, cock and, and snacks and they listen to the panel. And everybody's knee jerk reaction was just put that on camera. But, but we said, no, we're gonna make it into an actual show. And right now we're in the process of looking to PBS to see if they will air that. Um, because it's an actual show about history that was recorded more like a travel show instead of just mm -hmm. here this is, but it's still got a lot of the same information. We had we had a couple other questions come, on, come up. Uh, one was about, have YouTubers shown interest in the product? Uh, yeah, that is one of the clear use cases that we see for this type of translation work. Um, and some of it with the, the back-end machine translation that we have, we believe some of it production quality, they may not even be trying to get, uh, it's about immediate release rather than having human in the loop there for some of that content. For some of it, it is still human in the loop. Um, is there a video time limit for Mates Up? Uh, yeah, at this point in the beta, we have it limited to 30 minute videos. And does it work with any language combination? Simone, can you talk a little bit about the language combinations? Uh, yes. So basically, at the moment, we have uh, 10 languages for uh, automatic speech recognition. So if you want a tool to transcribe and translate the video directly, you have to choose among those 10 languages. Of course, if you need the 11th language, please write to us. That's a good mm -hmm. thing. And, and uh, if someone's using a broader language combination, if they have an SRT file, they can not automatically fill in the subtitles and go in and just use it as an editing and production tool. Yeah, I, I think we have like 30 languages now. I don't know, you know, uh, the, 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 we are adding a language every day. So mm -hmm. something like that, yeah. Well, Isabel, we're just at time. Mm -hmm. Oops. Yes, um, I think there's another question maybe, or let's see. Uh -huh. No, you answered all of them. So, and I would like to thank you all guys because this has been extremely interesting for us as well here at Gala. You gave us plenty of ideas on, on how to spice up our weekly webinars and our uh, conference. Um, so thank you all, really. Uh, it's been a tremendous pleasure to have you. Uh, and thank you to the attendees, of course. Um, and we would appreciate it if you could just take a minute to, to give us your feedback on today's sessions using the post-event survey. I promise you it's quite short. 
less than a minute of your time. Hey, but ten, tens are always welcome. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and of course, the feedback will help us uh, at Gala as well to, to refine our webinar program. Um, just let me conclude uh, saying that uh, we have had the webinar scheduled for uh, the, the next few weeks. And of course, we have the Gala connected at the end of March. The, the, the program has been published. So please go to the website, take a look and register if you so wish. But again, uh, Michael, Elora, Maren, and Simone, thank you so much. You gave us a glimpse of another world, very fascinating and uh, really exciting. So thank you very much and hope to see you again. Bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Guys.